Okay, uh, first, thank you very much for the introduction, Joe. Uh, and um, good evening, uh, everybody, again. Uh, my name is Xiang. Uh, I'm from the Adobe Digital Experience Globalization team. And I'm so happy uh, to be here tonight and to work with my colleague, uh, Alice and uh, Jay, to share our uh, experiences and learnings on building continuous localizations, uh, the solutions for software and uh, documentation at Adobe. Um, today, we will uh, cover the topics as below. And also, uh, within the presentation, we'll show you two quick demos. And first, let's talk about uh, globalization in Adobe very quickly. So Adobe has a, a broad uh, portfolio uh, of uh, products, ser services, and solutions. And now we are focusing on uh, two key growth areas. Um, the first one is uh, digital media business, which uh, includes uh, creative clouds such as uh, Photoshop, Illustrator, and uh, uh, Adobe Document Clouds, which including Acrobat and eSign solution. And there are another, uh, the second uh, focus area uh, is uh, digital experience business. Uh, by the way, our team is focused on this uh, business. Uh, we provide the digital experience cloud, uh, which offers a collection of integrated online uh, marketing and uh, the web analytics uh, solutions. The charter of uh, the globalization team at Adobe is to enable customers for digital experience success globally. And the globalization team in Adobe uh, works closely with the core engineering teams to, uh, and, and also the uh, globalization vendors to provide world ready products, services, and solutions to our customers. And uh, we are providing over 100 products on top of our web, desktop, and mobile. And uh, those products are localized into uh, 16 languages on average. And some of them uh, we localized into uh, 36 languages. By the way, maybe have, uh, having over 100 products doesn't sound much to, for a big company like Adobe. But most of the products which we count here are very com comprehensive, uh, complicated, and powerful products such as Photoshop or the big solutions like uh, Adobe Analytics. Um, also, the um, globalization team is in charge of uh, uh, providing the high quality localization of uh, related documentation and materials, including uh, the product documentation, marketing contents, uh, sales, and training materials. For example, uh, recently we are localizing the product documentation of uh, digital experience solutions into 11 languages which uh, includes uh, 154,000 uh, localized pages with over 100 million translated words. Um, Adobe is uh, one of the leaders in the subscription economy. We successfully move the whole business, including digital media and digital experience business, to the subscription model. In order to establish stronger customer relationships, and maximize the monthly or annual uh, recruiting revenue. We need to keep delivering the new features constantly and incrementally based on the uh, quick feedback from the market. At the same time, in order to maximize the ad value that we provide to the end user, we need to enable our customers to understand well about our products. So it is essential for us to enrich various documentation and update contents regularly and frequently while we deliver the innovative uh, product features in an agile way. Along with the changes uh, in the business strategy, we are now we are facing the new challenges of uh, speed and scalability on localizing software and documentation. And there, there are a lot of common point, points. So for the product globalization, uh, we need to enable continuous localization process as a part of CICD, continuous integration and continuous delivery. All the localization process should be fully automated and we must to reduce the delay due to the localization process. It is the same for documentation localization. So now we publish contents with small incremental in increments but much more frequently. 
So how to automatically hand off, hand off the localization process for documentation and localize a small chunk of changes with rapid response is essential for us. Automation testing is, uh, is important for us to maintain a high level of uh, quality with continuous localization for both software and documentation. Last but not least, how to provide a standardized process and common continuous localization framework is tightly linking with our team's efficiency and uh, scalability. Additionally, uh, for documentation part, uh, we are facing some new challenge to handle increasing volume with uh, more supported locales. Even we have the same challenges on both software and documentation, because the, the frameworks uh, in those two domains are different. So let's uh, deep dive into the solution one by one. Uh, first, let's talk about <coughs> software. Uh, today, we will focus on the continuous localization solution for the products of a digital experience cloud, which are mainly on web. Um, this is uh, the overview uh, architecture of a continuous localization framework designed for digital experience solutions. Uh, those key components uh, work together uh, to tackle the challenges that I mentioned within the, the, past, uh, the, the previous slides. Let me explain the, com uh, the components from bottom to top. Um, for the backend localization services, we are leveraging the existing uh, Adobe's uh, globalization infrastructure to arrange the human translation process and tasks, uh, manage uh, translation memories, and integrate uh, with the third-party translation service. Um, but at the same time, we enhanced the current uh, machine translation service, which provided by our uh, localization vendor, by adding a new machine translation engine, which is trained for Adobe software localization. Related with the first challenge that I mentioned uh, before, I mean, within the past uh, slide, the previous slide, in order to seamlessly integrate localization service services into the core team's CI/CD workflow, we built a new localization distribution service. We call it Lani. Uh, with this service, core developer, <coughs> sorry, core developers, uh, they can get human translation and machine translation result within seconds. And uh, we will share uh, more details of uh, Aladdin service within the, within the following slides. Um, to tackle uh, the second challenge, we're using Jenkins to build the automated process for product localization. With uh, this automation, uh, the workflow of new human translation tasks can be triggered automatically. And when the human translation process is done, the human translation result can be synced back to a loading immediately. Or we can trigger the localization pull request to the core team's uh, development environment directly. Additionally, we provide the best practices and uh, globalization friendly automation test framework, which uh, the core developers can use it to test and find uh, the internationalization localization bugs at the early phase by themselves. So let's focus on the, uh, the, the top layer. Um, as the last challenge, as I mentioned, um, is uh, how to work efficiently with the various uh, product teams at Adobe. So based on the, the build process and the technology that uh, they use, we, we need to build reusable uh, components to fit into their uh, framework. So what we, do, what we did is uh, <coughs> we built a set of uh, component libraries which handle internationalization, harvesting the localizable assets, and uh, handle the inter uh, interactions with uh, our backend localization service in an easy to integrate it approach. And also we uh, collaborate uh, with uh, uh, the Adobe's core infrastructure team to integrate localization service and process into a common CI-CD framework, which is widely used by the product teams in digital experience cloud business units. 
Um, within the following couple of slides, uh, we will give you more uh, introductions in detail on Aladdin and the uh, the standard globalization libraries and the enhanced common CICD framework with uh, the product product localization. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about Aladdin first. Um, within the past decade, Adobe's uh, globalization team built up a very powerful globalization framework to handle complicated uh, the product localization process. But the, but the user of the whole system, a globalization team ourselves, as well as the globalization uh, vendors, how to provide a simple and easy to use front end localization service to developers directly and shade the complexity of the back end localization services workflows is one of our keys to enable core engineers to handle product localization within their CI CD workflow. And Aladdin is a very good solution for that. Aladdin stands for Adobe Locale Aware Data Distribution Infrastructure, which uh, provides a set of uh, REST API for product localization. Uh, because at Adobe, uh, core engineer teams CI/CD <coughs> environment could be inside Adobe's network or on the public cloud, uh, such as uh, AWS. So Adobe need to be um, Aladdin service need to be accessible from various core teams environment. And here I listed up a couple of uh, API examples that the core engineers can simply do a put API call to send the English strings with the JSON format and do a get API call to get the related uh, localization results, which is uh, with the latest human translation and or Adobe trained uh, machine translation results. And they can do it uh, uninterruptedly and easily within their daily workflow. On the other hand, uh, the front end globalization automation use other Aladdin APIs to sync uh, the English dictionary changes from Aladdin to the backend uh, localization service, as well as uh, sync the human translation results from the backend to Aladdin too. By using Aladdin service, uh, the core developers can left shift their engagement with the globalization service from the beginning. They can get translation memory and uh, the machine translation or pseudo translation when they start working on their features and use them to test and find uh, internationalization localization issue and then fix those bugs uh, on the early stage, on the early phase. If, uh, and, and I think it's, it's very helpful to save a, a huge of effort on both core engineer side and globalization side. Although core engineer, uh, core engineering team uh, keep the product localization process running continuously as a part of uh, their CI/CD, uh, regarding to the product release, some of the teams uh, they do product release when all the human translation completed, and on the other hand, for some of the teams who are doing real CI/CD, which means uh, they do release frequently. And each of the release is with very limited new strings. They would like to keep delivering human translation with machine translation results to the end user instead of uh, slowing down their release cycle because just because they need to wait for the human translation process done. <coughs> Sorry. Um, within the past a couple of years, um, in Adobe, more and more core engineering teams they started to use React as the default JavaScript library to do the front-end web, de web development. So our team, uh, we start to think about, besides providing a Latin service as a common way to all developers to get the localization service, we should take a further step to develop a standardized solution for the product teams who are working on React-based uh, projects and enable them to handle product internationalization and localization easily. So we started to collaborate with the core engineer teams to build a common globalization library. We call it Adobe Intel React. 
Adobe Intel React library is, uh, is composed by three component libraries. Um, the first one is uh, Adobe Intel React. We use the same name for the, with the, the parent uh, library. It is, a, an, it is an international component library, which is uh, based on uh, React Intel. Uh, use a native browser <coughs> using native browser APIs uh, where possible. And the React Intel library is uh, an open source. And uh, we customize it to meet the requirement came from Adobe's uh, uh, core engineers. And um, uh, Adobe Intel React is a, a kind of a, an internal open, uh, open source. It provides uh, re uh, React components and uh, the APIs to localize dates, numbers, and strings. And it integrates uh, seamlessly with other two component libraries to provide a smooth uh, localization process for React-based applications. The second, uh, the second uh, component library is uh, Adobe Intel Harvester. This component uh, harvests the localizable assets to create dictionary in a flat JSON format or JLTN format. We call it JLAN format. So JLAN format is a JSON format with the metadata to support localization workflow, such as a, a description for the English string, which provide more uh, context to the to the to the translator. And uh, currently, uh, we support both uh, JavaScript and TypeScript with uh, with this library. Uh, the third one is uh, Adobe Intel Aladdin which is a, a connector to a Latin service to send out English strings and get human translation, machine translation back. back. It provides a standard uh, yet uh, configurable process for various type of uh, projects to handle uh, the communications between uh, communication with uh, the, the localization service. This is a, a basic workflow that uh, Alice will show you within her demo uh, after this after this slide. So, <coughs> sorry, the three components work together uh, to uh, to create a consistent way to handle internationalization and U.S. string localization. When developer uh, use this library, those libraries, um, she can focus on the coding of uh, the, the, the new feature. And after she finished uh, the implementation and did a build, within, uh, then within the build, Adobe Intel Harvester harvest the UI strings and generates the English dictionary with JSON format or JLAN format. And then Adobe Intel uh, Aladdin sends the English dictionaries to Aladdin service and then get the translation dictionaries, the translated results into a dictionary and back to put it back to the build, build environment. So in conclusion, with uh, this standardized and common globalization libraries, developers, they can focus on the new feature development and hide the complexity of uh, handling the localization as well as Simplify the communications with allowing uh, tra uh, the transition uh, translation service. Okay, uh, let me uh, hand off to Alice to show you a very quick demo of uh, Adobe Intel React. Alice. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Let me just take over the screen. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, great. So what I'm gonna be demonstrating is from the perspective of an engineer. So what I have here is a, uh, an application that um, it's really just a sample app that you have the ability to change languages and as I change languages, it will show the UI. Um, it's just so that we could use this application to demonstrate some of the features. So uh, let me show you how this, the, the code for this. So what I have here on the left side in my Sublime um, user is this iMug example app that I have. 
So in this application, I have a whole bunch of uh, JS files that are the different parts of this UI. And what I'll be demonstrating here is particularly this body, this JS part. Um, so you would have this, hello, I'm a participant, which is what I have here on the screen. Um, and then the strings, when we run the harvesting, uh, uh, let me just start right here. So what we have here is that we import the function from the Adobe INTL React as we shown, as Shang shown on the um, slide deck. And what it does is that when it runs the harvesting, it extracts the string into this folder for uh, localization folder. And in particular, when we're looking at one of these files, um, this is the JL10N file, which is the strings with the metadata to which we harvest to. And then um, it will convert into the English string and the, um, and, the, uh, and the German file right here. So that as I flip through this UI, you will see those translations right here. So let me just have a simple demonstration of how it works. So let's say, for example, as a developer, I want to add um, more UI um, to this. And I have already uh, a set of strings. So let me just put this new string in here. Just paste it in here. So make it easy, less typing, less chances of making typo mistakes. So here, once I save this file, what I will do is um, I will run the command here, let me bring up my window. I'll run the command to build with the localization. So what it will do is it will run the command that will harvest the string. So there is a, I saw that there was a question that was asking, how does it know what strings to run? So there is a JSON file that we have that specified where are the folders for this project to harvest from. So we'll scan into that folder looking for um, all the files that it's supposed to pick up, the JS file, the TypeScript files, and then it will gather harvested into a, a dictionary. Um, so in fact, it will notice that I modify the, the body file, the body.js file, and it has um, updates there, but no changes for the other source files. And then what it would then do, it will then call Aladdin, push the translation, uh, the English string up to the server, and then it will bring down the translation. Um, and here I've set it up to run about nine languages. So in fact, it's already done. And when I come back to view this project, you'll notice that let me just reload this, that here's the English string, and here's the German and the other locales. And when we take a look at the in Sublime here, you'll notice that the JL10N, the file that has the metadata in there is extracted with information here for description that we imported into our backend service and the updated translations for the different locales. And this is by calling Aladdin to get the latest translation. If Aladdin has the human translator strings, it will pick it up from there. If not, it will get the machine translation. So in terms of demonstration, that's all I'll, I'll show. But there are other, uh, the date and time formatting as well. Um, so let me go back to the slide deck. So this is from the developer's point of view in terms of, uh, in terms of building locally. This is how the typical engineer to do the building. So let me just show you uh, how we do this in a build process. So in a CICD pipeline, so you would build, uh, for the engineer, they would build locally. They'll uh, check to see if the UI they added looks correct to them. They'll change locale to make sure that um, the layout looks proper and the character display properly. Then they'll submit their code. And then usually when you get into Git and you submit to Git, it'll run through a uh, online integrated um, build process, a CICD build process pipeline. 
So this is an example of a CICD build pipeline that we work with the product team to incorporate localization as part of their continuous integration delivery system. Um, for performance, what we did is that we added the localization as a parallel step as a unit test. For this particular um, team, the reason we're doing it here is because our um, localization internationalization test is here in the integration test. So therefore, we're just uh, improving the performance by doing it here, but it can be configured in different ways. So it depends on the need of the engineering team, the project, it can be configured many different ways. So in this localization step, just like what I've shown, like what the developer is doing, what it does is it does the harvesting of the strings using Adobe INTL Harvester. Then it communicates with Aladdin to get the latest translation, be it machine translation or human translation. And then currently it takes about 10 to 24 seconds for this step to run on the pipeline, the build pipeline. Not shown in this diagram, it's a step that we do auto committing. So um, as part of the build chain, um, it calls Aladdin to fetch the latest translation. And then it will do a commit to the Git repository and then it can raise a PR. And this way what we can do is we can deliver the latest translation as part of this CICD build process and pipeline. So what I've shown is how an engineer would normally um, work to add a new feature, then could uh, be able to locally test and view um, a localized UI as well as the English. And then once they submit their changes online, the build pipeline, when it's integrated with the localization, then they could also get the translations that way. So what I'm gonna do is that this is, in conclusion, this is the conclusion for the um, software localization presentation part. And I'm gonna hand it off to Ajay to show the continuous localization for documentation. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Alice. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so now I'm going to talk about continuous localization for, for documentation. So I'm going to reiterate what Xiang has already shown in one of his uh, early slide. Uh, this is um, mostly about documentation. So uh, basically product document teams have made significant changes on their end to standardize the way documents are authored and deployed and have also improved the speed and scalability on their end. And due to this changes, we at the globalization team are facing the new challenge for document localization, such as um, localizing small in small increments with rapid response, uh, automate localization handoff, um, automate testing, uh, standardize source content and process them, uh, handle increased volume uh, with support for more language to be added. Um, and to take up this challenge, uh, we had um, added a lot of improvements on our end and uh, uh, for the continuous with the continuous localization. So localization content uh, before the continuous localization, only 60 percent, uh, less than 60 percent of the content were covered by for localization. Uh, we had very limited budget for human translation, and with continuous localization, uh, 100 percent of uh, the lang contents are now translated with empty first strategy and followed with HD. So when I say here empty first um, strategy, uh, what I mean is the contents, whenever they are authored, they go through our uh, uh, workflow system and they get, uh, they, uh, they get translated using translation memory and whatever is remaining, which were not translated by translation memory, they goes through our empty engines, and from there they get translated and published live uh, with the empty uh, with the TM and empty content. And then um, at the same time, uh, you, human translation kit is basically being worked on by human translation. So till the time human translation comes back, uh, empty empty uh, TM plus empty uh, will serve as the as the need for uh, on our published pages. 
And then the second one is uh, basically empty widget. Uh, to empty, we are using empty widget uh, on the red box on the right. Uh, we use that to switch between locales, uh, not locales actually, switch between la uh, language and English. So let's say if some users are not happy with our machine translation, uh, then they will they can always use the switch to switch between um, English versus translated or automatic translated page. And we only show this widget when the page is machine translated. And when it's completely human translated, we, we hide that uh, widget for a user to switch between. And then uh, we also use analytics, our own, uh, Google, um, Adobe's own analytics tool uh, to analyze the page about uh, how the translation quality is, whether they like it or not. Uh, so if you see the blue box on the, on the corner, um, that's where user can opt in and opt out for uh, not opt-in and opt-out, they can say yes or no whether they like the translation or not. We, in addition, we are also getting the feedback whenever a user switch between the translated con content and English, we get the feedback and then we try to um, send those page uh, for human translation for better quality if they are too, switching too many times. And um, And the next improvement we did on the localization process was uh, prior to continuous localization, uh, we had manual handoffs. Uh, and obviously, uh, since it was manual, it was monolithic volume, but lots of bulk of data. Uh, and that used to take weeks to months to get it translated. And then there was hardly any testing done on those uh, data uh, with, for the syntax validation and all the other things. Uh, but with the continuous localization, uh, we automated the, trend, um, the handoff process. Uh, we used TM plus MT as our, our first uh, MT first strategy, followed by HD. And then we can always send the files uh, in a small increments for rapid response. Uh, that way we can get the files translated within, within seconds to minutes, depending on the amount of data. And then we have also set up automation validation testing, validation or testing. And uh, that is all automated. Uh, so what you're seeing on the right is the basically an author comes to the page. Uh, it's a different diff, uh, difference, a diff between the two uh, chunks of data where author have edited. The red one is where uh, they removed it. And the green one is they replaced the, the old one with the new data. And on the bottom red block, which you're seeing uh, the highlight red is the commit ID. So the reason I'm showing you the commit ID is because in the next page, uh, the commit ID C95FF25, we are tracking that to know uh, which localized page belongs to uh, which English change. So in this case, if you see from the top red block, uh, we already have the source git commit ID, which is C95FF25 uh, hash ID of git. And then we also uh, record the word count difference between them. And then we also have the HD degree. Basically, the HD degree tells how the page content, how much of the page content is translated by human or by TM. And, and the remaining, which is not, not translated by human or the TM, is, is basically empty. So in this case, the whole page is translated by empty. And uh, you can see the translation where uh, difference of the translation. And the next one is community contribution. So prior to uh, core team implemented uh, the new work workflow on their end, uh, there was no community contribution. But then with the new infrastructure they had in place, uh, there was uh, support for community contribution for English, but obviously we didn't have that. But with the continuous localization um, framework, we also incorporated that. So now we uh, currently, um, we, are, um, we have the support for, uh, com community contribution, as well as uh, internal or external customer can contribute to our data. Uh, to demonstrate that uh, in this uh, slide, if you see the the user can come and click the edit button here, which will take them to the Git repository. And here they can come and provide a feedback by editing the file and uh, basically provide any, any feedback they would like to provide uh, 
to the user. So once they provide the feedback and commit the changes and raise the PR, that PR goes to our internal review reviewers and our internal reviewers can, can review the changes and approve it if, if they are satisfied with. If not, they can always uh, communicate with the user who has submitted the feedback for uh, more, more data if they need to. So um, this is the architecture of uh, continuous localization for documentation. And I'll walk through each layer and explain their functionality. Uh, let's begin with the top layer in yellow, product CI CD framework. So on the left, uh, we have a code repository where each product has its own repository per language. For example, product A will have English, French and Japanese repositories. Product will be will have its own English, French, and uh, Japanese repositories. And on the right, we have Jenkins, which will take care of build, test, deployment for English and as well as for languages, all the languages. So we don't have to worry about setting up a separate environment just for localization. To achieve this, we have worked closely with product documentation team to integrate localization testing needs. And then let, let's move on to our next layer in blue, uh, which is Adobe localization framework. This is the core of our localization framework. And uh, we have a, um, a messaging bus that allows any system to produce or publish and subscribe to different types of events. Uh, it is powered by Apache Kafka with our custom framework layer over it. It is completely event-driven, asynchronous communication between systems. In this architecture, um, uh, Git, Jenkins, and translation memory system, which is in the pink box on the right, uh, are published, are, uh, are they use publish and subscribe uh, to, this, uh, to this bus system. So whenever there is a git change, um, change uh, bus will notify Adobe backend, uh, backend infrastructure. Same thing for Jenkins and same thing for TMS system. Whenever there's a, a new localization handoff is completed, it gets, uh, the bus gets notified, it triggers the Jenkins job, it processes the file for validation, and then it returns, uh, if everything is successful, the files gets committed back to Git repository. And, um, and then next is our Okapi framework. So Okapi framework is, um, is a cross-platform and open source set of components and application. Uh, we utilize this to convert the markdown file to XLIF that will be sent to both HT and MT services. And con once the translation is done, it gets con uh, the Okapi framework converts the extra file back to Markdown. We have enhanced the Okapi Markdown component to fit to our custom needs, as we are using GitHub Markdown flavor with additional custom tags. And then next uh, we have Adobe Backend Infrastructure. Uh, this is the most uh, this this does the most heavy lifting of um, of, uh, to work with different systems such as Okapi, Bus, Adobe, MT Connector, and Translation Memory System. There are a lot of other small components built into Adobe backend infrastructure, uh, such as databases and a lot of logics built into it. And then the next is um, Adobe Machine Translation Connector. Um, it's a layer to connect different um, machine translation services. It takes out of out the complexity of adding a new empty vendor without impacting to the internal services that are consuming uh, Adobe MT service. It is also it also normalizes the text before sending it to MT engines, the outside uh, third-party vendor MT engines. We have enhanced the current machine translation service provide provided by our localization vendor that are trained with Adobe document document TMs and terminology. Uh, so here I'll walk 
I'll walk you through the workflow, how exactly uh, things move around in our system. So let's say an author uh, grabs a file from Git repository and edits, edits some file, uh, edit, edits are made. He's, he or she submits the file back to the Git repository. As soon as the file are submitted, uh, Jenkins gets notified. It, um, it grabs the file, it validates and package, package the file and then sends to our publishing um, deployment, deploy to our publishing environment where it gets extracted and converted to an uh, HTML. And so same, at the same time, uh, as soon as the author commits the file to English repository at the same time, there's another event got triggered, uh, tracked by bus, uh, Ruby localization framework bus. Uh, and then Okapi converts the file from Markdown to XLIF, and then it sends to our transition mem memory management system. And where for each file, there's two localization, for each language, there are two localization kits gets created. One for an HT and another for, for MT. Uh, so HT, human can translate at, the, at their convenience. For with, with the MT, uh, it gets first leveraged by our translation memory. And then as soon as the, uh, and whatever is not done, it, it uh, leveraged by machine translation. And then it's pushed back to our Okabi framework where it gets converted to Markdown and pushed back to the respective French repository product repository. And a uh, similar uh, thing will happen for Japanese where the file gets again, converted from XLIF to Markdown and pushed back to Japanese repository. And once those files hit the repository, again, uh, Jenkins gets triggered. Um, they grab the file and basically validates uh, for syntaxes, links, uh, any URLs and uh, anything we need to validate. Again, get package push to our uh, experience link deployment uh, server where it gets unpackaged, converted into HTML. And then uh, finally, once they are uh, pushed, they get activated and pushed live. And that's where on the live server, we have our empty widget hosted. Um, and then users, whenever they reach the page um, based on the uh, the percentage of uh, translation, if it's 100% translated, they will not see the widget. If not, they will see the empty widget on the page. Uh, now I'll show you the demo of uh, how the files can be quickly received. Uh, sorry. So uh, with the, so this is my, um, Uh, this is my English repository. As you can see, I'm a G11 demo EN, and I have one file here. And this file is basically, uh, I have some data here. This is a Markdown file. And if I switch to, um, so this is my French repository. Uh, as you can see, it is suffixed with um, French um, BCP47 locale system. And then again, it has the same uh, file with uh, some translation. And same thing I have for Japanese where we have, uh, again, translation for Japanese. Uh, same, and, and we have more data here like source, git commit. We have a workflow type, which we are using. It's a TMMT workflow, or it was triggered for human translation, not if we don't want something. And then how many word counts we have and the HD degree. So in this case, it was, uh, uh, no, it was completely 100% machine translated. So if I go back to English and edit the file here. And then I'll paste some data. So basically I pasted some data and we have our custom tags. Uh, for example, this one says that uh, empty engine not to translate um, uh, whatever is passed in this particular block. And uh, same thing here. And then we also have a, a special tag called UI control. So whichever UI's uh, screen, uh, so UI, menu, UI items we don't want to translate. So let's say uh, a French language was not, uh, the UI was not translated. So we don't want 
UI controls to be translated. So in this case, I have made French as uh, UI control not should be not be translated. For Japanese, we want UI controls to be translated. So once I go and submit those change, and it goes to hit our localization framework, and then. Um, it goes to our empty process, and if I refresh this, uh, let's see. Uh, meanwhile, I'll also check Japanese here. Uh, it may take a few seconds. course we are doing demo so let's make a few more seconds here and while we wait I'll show you how um, so this is our hosted live page uh, the actual product page and this is in English so if I switch in let's say French uh, this page automatically shows um, our empty widget where it's showing all the French translation. And as soon as I, I say, I don't want to see the automatic translation, it switches back to English. And we go back here and see. Okay, so we have the translation back. And basically within 18 seconds ago, it was pushed. And there are 35 words. Again, it was 100% empty translated. And the reason it's only empty translate because I'm not connected any TM. Uh, I'm not hooked up any TM for this demo project uh, for the sake of the demo. And you can see as this one was not translated, this one was not translated. And um, the UI control was translated for Japanese. But if you go back for French, um, if the translation is back, Let's wait a couple more seconds here. Okay, I think um, for the sake of the time, I'll just skip that part and go back to the next piece in the slide. So, Shang. Please go ahead and uh, take. Shang, can you hear me? Oh, sorry, I, I muted. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, okay, uh, thank you, Ajay, thank you, Alice. Uh, so at last, uh, let me spend a couple of minutes to uh, outline, outline the, the main takeaway from this uh, presentation. Um, there are, there are some key learnings when we built the continuous localization for software and documentation in Adobe. Um, the first point is uh, standardization. Uh, standardization by means of uh, standardize the type of uh, source contents uh, if it is possible. For example, we use uh, JSON or JLang format for uh, continuous localization uh, for software. And uh, we use uh, <coughs> Markdown as the standardized uh, format for documentation. Um, also, standardization uh, in, term of, in terms of uh, providing uh, standardized and common libraries. So, for example, in Adobe, uh, we uh, for software we provide Adobe Intel uh, React library, and for documentation we are using the common libraries in Okapi framework to do the file uh, conversion. Also. Um, Providing a standardized way to handle, uh, not not yet, to handle the localization process uh, automatically is uh, is a very important for both software and and, um, and documentation. So the next point, uh, the next point is um, is on the way to uh, to transform from CI/CD to CI/CLCD. Instead of uh, working out uh, ten continuous localization solutions for 10 different uh, CI/CD framework. 
you should uh, spend your effort and focus on the most common CI/CD framework in your company, which uh, is widely used by your core developers. And you need to make sure the integration of uh, localization process is easy and seamless, so that uh, it's not a big lift lift for the core team to to add it into their CI/CD framework. And the third uh, key point is uh, machine translation. Um, machine translation is very helpful. It's very helpful for us to uh, shorten the turnaround time and uh, make the delivery faster, much faster. But uh, there, are, there are some common challenges on both uh, software and documentation for us in Adobe. Uh, for example, machine translation engine, you need to, the engine itself needs to be uh, trained with the right terminology and huge amount of uh, translation memory data. Also for software, you need to work with your MT service provider to handle the placeholder well. Additionally, uh, you should do automation tests to make sure the MT results don't cause any functional issue especially. On the other hand, uh, with the CI-CLCD, because the process becomes much faster than before. So we believe that you can take more risks to deliver machine translated contents which haven't been reviewed. So, and if you find any issue, you can fix it very quickly and, and deploy it again. That's the, that's the beautiful of uh, uh, the agile development, that the, the, the beautiful of CI, CL, CD. The, the fourth point is, uh, is quality. Quality always always a challenge. And it's, it's also common for both software and documentation. Our learning is terminology management is essential for quality. So for human translation, with a better uh, terminology management, you can avoid translation issues such as uh, the consistency issue or the wrong translations. On the other hand, uh, as I mentioned, Terminology data is very, very important for you to train a good MT engine. Also, terminology is uh, the glue between software and documentation. It helps to keep the consistency of translation between the two domains. Uh, at the same time, in order, to <coughs> in order to maintain a high level of quality, it requires more automation tests. With the trend of uh, agile development now, you, you, can, you can't really stop the train be just because of uh, the localization. So you need to make sure that the source is well internationalized and localization test is fully automated. So, okay, that's all for our presentation and let's move to the QA session. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Xiang, Ajay, and Alice. Um, the, the questions are just flying in here. I can't even keep up with trying to. <laughs> I saw to a lot stuff. of uh, very good questions, yeah. Yeah, I'm going, here, let me see. Uh, oh yeah, Daphne just added one. We won't miss those. I actually copied them into another document so I could uh, oh, track great. what was being answered. And I don't think we want folks to <clears throat> miss those. So just quickly, uh, Alex from Toronto popped in there and asked, how do products get translations if the service, Aladdin, is down? And Jean-Francois jumped right in there and said they'd have to wait until the service is back up. That's why we aim to offer a 99.99% availability service. Uh, I'm afraid to ask what the availability is right now. Yeah, I think uh, basically that's the, that's the answer. Uh, we are doing our best to make sure that the server itself is uh, with full night uh, quality. Uh, so make the service be uh, uh, robust. And uh, also, uh, I think it's linked to another question is about uh, uh, the product teams, uh, their, uh, their style, their style to do the uh, development, uh, deployment. So I think I mentioned within one slide that uh, in the middle uh, re regarding to uh, the different team, product team, uh, take the different way uh, related with the delivery, the final delivery. Uh, some of the core team, uh, they 
have a kind of uh, uh, stop. Uh, they uh, have a either a feature flag or they have the staging server and they confirm everything be ready uh, and everything be translated by human, they release. But some of the product team, for example, if the service or if the products, uh, the, the, the solution is more backend service and uh, most of the, the strings uh, related with the back, backend uh, message, error message and so on. So for those kind of uh, 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 the, 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 the products, they deliver it in, uh, directly. And in that case, uh, to be honest, if the survey is done, then they can only, they deliver the English directly. And um, to add to Shang's point um, and to Jeff's point, uh, we have um, in Adobe, we have a server infrastructure team, and that's where our services are deployed. And those team take responsibility of keeping the server up and running. Um, 99.9% .9 of the time. So that that's something we don't have to worry about. And those are the teams, they are also supporting other Adobe uh, product teams to keep their server up and running. And there's a great infrastructure behind that. Yeah, basically we're using the same uh, infrastructure that uh, Adobe provide the real, I mean, not real, but the, the product or services to the end user. If that environment down, probably you cannot use that always uh, some of the product or solution. That's why I went back to stuff on disk instead of subscription, but okay. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the, then Daphne asked, how do you enforce all engineering teams to always fetch translations from Aladdin? Uh, and JF's answer was that we provide them libraries that connect the product environment to Aladdin and then see Alice's demo. So maybe we don't have to drill down on that one. Um, I've got one that, uh, unless you want to jump in there, I've got one that wasn't answered. Jaco, uh, React int requires a syntax that is very verbose, requiring developers to modify the templates a lot when internationalizing them. How did you solve this? Alice, do you want to jump in to answer the question? Um, I'm I'm not quite sure which part of verboseness that was uh, being asked, but I think what we did share in the demo uh, pretty quickly is what the format looks like, and um, you can extend it definitely. So I I I, I guess I I just don't know which part was there a specific part that that was difficult to extend, um, I'm not sure. Oh, I, I think what the question is really about React, uh, the, in general, the syntax of React is verbose. Uh, that's what I, I got it from that question. Right, it's so we, we, we do provide a, a, a certain way of, of uh, setting up the, uh, the, the API call, so, I I guess I'm I guess we we just do support it. I'm not quite sure exactly if there was some specific issue that you would have that we might not have an equivalent of. Then I would have to take a look. And also just to add to that, what Alice has said, we on our team uh, have uh, uh, the uh, uh, INTL React library, Adobe INTL React library, has been uh, modified a little bit to make those task a little bit easier, the, the syntax is a little bit easier, but I'm not sure if it was 100% covered, uh, depending on what specific question or specific format you have uh, seen. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. I'm going back and forth between messages and questions. Okay, so we have... Uh, A similar question, how do you tell Adobe INTL Harvester what strings to attract, uh, extract for localization? 
so in uh, when I was running it uh, locally, I uh, what I didn't show, um, I kind of mentioned it, but I didn't show that particular file. We do have a configuration file for each of the project. And that configuration file not only specified the number of locale for this particular project and which um, Aladdin um, service name project that it should use, but also it specified which files to harvest, like it would just say, you know, anywhere <laughs> from this location and then downward or exclude these files. So there is a harvest formula. Okay. Uh, and that, that question was from Carlos, just to be clear. Uh, then we had Marcel and uh, some of this you folks were answering, but he was asking how does the developer know the localized strings are just temporary MT strings and, and how does the uh, L10N prevent incorrect MT strings to go out into the product? Uh, <clears throat> so uh, Alice well, answered that uh, in regard to MT and string correctness, the MT engine we use, engines we use are trained by Adobe and periodically retrained with corrected strings. As part of the commit PR, we, are, we have opportunities to review the strings. Uh, let's see and here. Additionally, um, uh, also, Aladdin provide a uh, API to uh, the core team uh, to get the current status so that uh, the uh, the developer or the pipeline, the build pipeline, uh, can easily understand whether all of the string are human translated or there are some machine translated. Uh, so by leveraging that uh, that API, you can combine those uh, the result within your uh, build pipe the the build process to judge whether it's ready to release or not. If you want to uh, release with a 100% human translation, then you wait. If you're not, if you want to deliver it, then you can delete. And uh, we also have an option to uh, not include MT. So, so let's say in case they want to deliver the product but don't want to have MT, they can always, uh, with a, just an API parameter, they can always get the uh, the English version with with the human translated and partially English version of the file. I, I think I, one. I, 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 I'm muted myself. I'm not sure you can hear me. This is Marcel. We hear you. So thank you, thank you, AJ, thank you, Alice, and thank you, Xiang, uh, for this amazing, uh, wonderful presentation. So some of these uh, things are things that when I was still eBay, we were um, trying to achieve, um, but and but it was folded on the fact that developers just don't get it. It's not that they're stupid, they're really smart, but they don't understand foreign languages, even though most of them don't have native English as a native language. But just the fact that you say, this is MT, doesn't mean anything. So you have the option to not go out with MT or in English, is not, it, it doesn't necessarily strike as a, as a warning. Like, well, if the localization team provides these translations using MT, surely that means that the MT is good enough to be provided. Therefore, surely we can roll this out with no problem. But why would we wait for anything better? And this is just a, a generalization, but this is something I have found um, many, many times over in, in my many years in localization including at eBay, not to find fault with anybody at eBay at the moment, but um, developers just want to get stuff done and they want to move and they have like their 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 product manager and the development manager on, like, oh, we need to release, that's the deadline and the demo is end of the week. And so, hey, translation is there, I can read it, but Elton provided it, so surely it's good enough. And, um, and, and this is something that I find if you give developer choices about things that they don't understand, they will tend to choose the option that's least painful to them based on how much they don't understand what the actual pain is. Um, I, since you're all in Elton N with many, many years of experience, I think you know what I mean, but how do you deal with that? I, I put in a few questions as well. How do you stop things from going wrong? when you automate to the extent that you're doing, right? You're making a lot of assumptions like, oh, the source content must be good. There must be no garbage coming in. 
uh, there must be no like untranslatable content coming in. Um, I, and so I ask you, what kind of tests do you do? Um, so I'm really, really curious to find out like how are you attempting to solve this? Because I don't think you have that. I'm I'm not assuming that you, no. I don't think you are pretending to have the full solution uh, and have an answer to everything. Um, but I'm really, really uh, uh, curious to know and uh, what you guys have been doing to minimize uh, this, this kind of negative impact that developers can have. Not because not of malice, just because they just want to write code, right? They don't care about foreign languages. They don't even care about the English, let alone about the German or or, or the. <coughs> So um, I, I, there's developer education, which goes this is so far. So where's my camera? Yeah. Um, but in actual, I think I've been on the front line of dealing with developers on a day-to-day -day basis for 18 years. Saying no, you can't. That no, that doesn't work that way. You cannot translate. So um, the more and more we push into automation and continuous delivery, continuous localization. Um, these questions actually become m bigger and bigger. So I'm, I'm really curious to see, um, to hear what, what Adobe is doing to uh, make sure that these things don't get into the localization pipeline. And I apologize for being so long-winded because, but that's just who I am. I apologize for that. Um, very, very good question. And that that is the, the similar concern uh, in our team. I think uh, I trade this, uh, I traded with uh, two different parts. One it was uh, the um, the functional issue caused by uh, machine translation, and another part is a uh, kind of a uh, linguistic issue whether uh, machine translation translate in the in in the right way from the linguistic perspective. So for the first part, um, in Adobe we are providing and also we are working on the uh, tools or uh, the services which we, when we get the machine translation, we detect whether there are any issues, for example, placeholder. Whether we have the same matching of the placeholder that uh, English string has, and we detect whether we have the same format uh, syntax within the all of the translated uh, strings. Uh, and also, another key point is uh, within the, the slides, uh, we said that uh, the automation testing is very important. So. One, so how to engage and enable the core team to enhance their automation test framework and ask them to add more and more automation testing on their way so that when they get the translation back, they can repeat, uh, use their test framework, but run with the, 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 the other locales, but confirm whether there are any functional issues. Just because we we use the the other translate I mean the other locales uh, data to do that, so all of the, the two parts one is the uh, the kind of uh, the guard of uh, the MT, especially for the placeholder part. Another part is uh, we need to enha keep enhancing the automation part uh, for the testing, which cover or leverage the translated string. And the second part, the second different angle related with the kind of linguistic translation itself. Uh, as I mentioned um, in the takeaway, I think, takeaways. So because along with the, the agile development, uh, the life cycle becomes very short. So if we really think that uh, uh, the, if the core team get the, the, the mindset to say, okay, even machine translation may have some not run translation, but not so appropriate uh, linguistic uh, translation, then we can do a very quick fix when the human translation is done. Or uh, to be honest, uh, in Adobe, we do machine translation and we send it, trigger the human translation process uh, immediately. And within the human translation, we do the, the post edit. So it's a kind of human based on machine translation to review that. So even we have some, uh, wrong translation or appropriate translation with machine translation. If we keep the, 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 the is roll back, is roll, uh, keep moving forward, then we can get the, the correction very quickly. And it's keep developing, uh, it's keep de uh, deploying, deploying. 
So that is kind of a mindset that uh, both the globalization team as well as the, the core engineering team, we need to we need to have some change. Otherwise, uh, it's, it's really difficult for the for the agile development. So does it does that mean that you can request the developing teams to roll a new release uh, just because you now updated the translation so that the finally had a chance to do human review? Uh, when the human translation is done, we can uh, push the pull request on our side. And the same, uh, mm, because the I, I forget about the Git interaction, but I mean about actually pushing into prod. That's the continuous delivery. Do you, do you have access to the continuous delivery? Because this has been a pipe dream at eBay for the many decades that I was there, uh, saying, well, well, you can put stuff out that's wrong as long as you allow us to roll stuff over it to fix it again uh but that was all the no we can only re release at this this like three hour window every two weeks uh, so if you put something out bad that's bad then you have to wait three weeks and that's what that was for web now uh, with adobe which is this broad suite of, of products uh ob obviously cloud is a big part of that uh but like with, with the products that are like you know that need to be downloaded by the user it get updated uh, those kind of decisions of pushing out like, well, this is unreviewed. Nobody knows what it really says in Chinese. Um, how, how do you how do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, maybe, maybe I could uh, ad address it in a slightly different way, Marcel. So um, I too work with the engineering team a lot, and I do work with a lot of engineering team, and I share, mm -hmm. you know, what some of the things that you discuss. Um, and I think when we talk about CI/CD, there's uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, and the D also is continuous deployment. Right. So we do internally do continuous delivery, but not necessarily continuous deployment to our customers. Okay. So what our engineering team does is uh, that they would make changes and builds would be constantly building and every build merge, every PR will be tested through those pipeline and validation going through. Um, to add on to that complexity, um, there was the other question about um, holding on for human translation is that many of the new features nowadays in continuous delivery is that they, they are sit behind feature flags. So although we are running translation, we don't necessarily are delivering it to the customer as a feature that they are visible to see. So that's the other question about whether we are holding off to translation. because. Um, so once we do do the build and in Adobe, depending on the team, some teams do weekly deployments, some teams do, you know, a couple times a week, uh, then there is a, a validation period. It is quick, we do agree, but we are also constantly testing as well. So there would be every sprint to two weeks, there are features to be tested. So we're constantly testing these features and validating it. And then after we do translation and we do uh, quick fixes as well. So that's how we kind of compensate for that um, kind of rolling releases as you're talking about. So okay. the engineering team understand that. Okay, cool. Because I, I've, we've been pushing like doing continuous delivery and continuous uh, localization since like 2014 at, e at eBay when I was still there. Um, but we always find that that because localization becomes a black box and developer say, oh, I don't know, I check things in and the next day it's in German and Japanese and Chinese and I don't know what happens, it just happens. Uh, they just make all kinds of assumptions not based on any kind of validation of those assumptions. Like, well, oh, it's really good. So as soon as you throw machine translation into the mix, um, it, 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 it requires like a, um, a manual in and of itself at all. You know, it's like, well, this is just a machine translation placeholder. It's like, it, it could be 90% good, it could be 100% good, it could be 60% bad. Um, but but they don't understand that it. it's, it's localized. They can't read it, therefore it must be good. Um, so the the gatekeeping for uh, function of, of localization and making sure that the quality is, is preserved as much as possible uh, be, becomes that much more. So I'm not, fine, I'm not trying to criticize or please don't get me wrong. Uh, we are all working on this thing, in this thing and trying to find out what is the right, what is a good approach and trying to share best practices and stuff. So, um, 
Um, yeah. But, but yeah. I, I, I find that because developers don't understand localization, they have a hard time understanding, um, you know, the, the complications of it. And we, we try to simplify it. We we automate it. We 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 put it behind an API. And it's all automatic, and and it's it's not even asynchronous. It's synchronous. Uh, you know, you click your fingers and bang. There is the German, but it's not always understood what 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 it really goes into it. And and I think from a from a, an overall holistic product point of view, from a global product point of view. Um, I, I remember we used to do these surveys at eBay, and I apologize for talking too much, uh, where we would get feedback, like NPS scores, from our, from, from, our, from, our, from, our, from our customers. And the main negative feedback that we would get back was, oh, Elton is a black box. Things just happen. We don't know anything about it. It's just, just there. Uh, um, so it's a positive that that's phrased as, as a negative or vice versa. Uh, but I think it's a real thing that developers you know, well, it happened, so it must be good because somebody, somebody is doing this, so it must be good. So we can't trust, you know, expect them to take uh, responsibility for it. But if the L10N teams don't have any handle on well, the progression of the product, it becomes that much harder to make sure. It, it's like a part that we have to play, but we we don't always have the 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 the, the ways of of uh, the, the methods that we need to play the part. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking right now so other people can talk. So thank you, Alice. Thank you, AJ. And uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Xiang. I really appreciate this presentation. It was really good. And thanks thank for you. your thoughts, Marcel. Uh, we should, that, those were, uh, that was a good discussion. We should probably uh, run through the questions as quickly as we can, though, so uh, yeah. people can finish up here. We're, we're at 26 attendees at this point. Um, and uh, one of them seems like a quick enough question. Carmen asked, how do you know what strings need human translation or more thorough post-editing? Is there a way for product teams to flag high visibility, sensible strings, or is this something that would come later in QA stages? That's part of working with the product management teams so that they create stories, stories for that sprint. And then as the engineering team are doing development and continuously deploying updates, that's when we're doing testing and flagging issues. And then they're fixing it before release for deployment. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then uh, JF answered this one. Um, uh, Igor asked, if you're localizing in small increments, do linguists see the bigger picture, the full documents and pages, and how do you provide context in this incremental translation scenario? So the answer was that translators can preview the translate, translated pages, even if they just translate some segments. Straightforward enough. Uh, and um, then uh, Marcel had a... Uh, discussion about whether there's a hold on release until uh, human translation is integrated. So uh, the answer was that uh, you folks are focusing on improving your in MT engines and having a few quality checks in the pipeline. Uh, and in regards to a hold for human translation, our teams are doing continuous delivery for test and integration. Release and deployment are on a weekly or biweekly schedule. We do not hold HT for continuous delivery. For new feature, uh, for new features for release, we do validate the translation uh, uh, is uh, as expected. So hopefully that answered the question there. Um, but here's one that uh, did not get answered in the uh, chat room. Uh, Daphne asks, do all products take the same translation format? Uh, why ML, JSON, JSON properties, uh, et cetera. If different, who, how to configure the format each product will get? Okay, uh, for digital uh, experience, uh, digital experience business uh, unit, uh, which uh, our team is working on. So basically all of the team are asked to use either uh, the flat JSON format or JLAN format. 
So if they have any other formats, uh, they need to uh, work with us to uh, think about whether they can uh, develop the converter to convert uh, those formats to a JSON or JLab format, or uh, we need to some, find some other ways to do that. So basically the answer is uh, that is the standardized format which we support for continuous localization. And because uh, most of the team in digital experience business units, uh, they are working on the, uh, the web-based solutions. So they are pretty, uh, I mean, it's accept acceptable for them to use a JSON format. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Constantine asked, Ajay, how do you deal with potential MT issues such as incorrect tone of voice, profanity, or omissions? Do you have APE or MTQE systems in place? Do you use only MT training or also add custom terminology on top of it for things like product names and acronyms? Um, th thank you, that's, that's a good question. So we are currently not using anything to check for um, check for uh, the grammars. grammars. Uh, mostly we are doing, uh, we definitely do apply our TM. So when we train our engine, we, we, we train with our terminology. So when a product name is passed, the MT engine automatically do not translate those, uh, those uh, product names. And um, we also train our empty engines with uh, do not translate list. We also maintain a do not translate list where uh, apart from product list, we also have a list which we do not want to translate. So those also get passed when training the engine. And in addition, uh, we are asking authors, uh, as you have seen in my demo, we are asking them to put a tag as DNL or UI control uh, tags around the text which they are sure about uh, not to translate or or are are the part of UI control. So those are the steps we are taking to to control um, uh, the output of empty results. Hope that answers your question. Okay. Uh, well, I see at the bottom of the chat, Constantine says, "Thanks for the answers and a great presentation." So I guess that did answer his question. Uh, now here's a question I'm not sure you can answer. Igor says, uh, looks like a serious runtime. And he asks, how many servers or nodes are supporting your localization infrastructure? And how many engineers have to support it? A little winky emoji there. Uh, as uh, Ajay mentioned, uh, after uh, maybe another question before. So we are using a, a kind of a, a a standard way that Adobe infrastructure team are providing. So uh, within our team, we don't have any engineer to maintain the service itself. But uh, in Adobe, they are a professional uh, infrastructure team. They are handle that. And uh, the, the, that, per, that team provide a very uh, uh, scalable uh, way to, if we need more instance or more CPU, uh, we are easy, very easy to extend that based on usage, uh, which uh, I mean, the, based on the needs from the core team. And also, it automatically spins up more servers if there's more traffic. Uh, so we we initially have set up, let's say, four four servers, uh, and then four servers are running. And if there is a need, uh, there is too much traffic, then definitely we we uh, the the IT infrastructure take care of uh, doing that. But so far, the whatever service we service we are hosted, they are doing a good job. We are not seeing any traffic. We constantly monitor uh, those servers for any additional traffic needed um, or, or any major traffic happening there. Okay. Well, Adobe is the cloud, yes. <laughs> uh, Daphne asks, uh, re internal review to review customer changes. What's the percentage of customers using this? Which teams do the internal review? And I believe Daphne asked for documentation. Uh, so 
currently we haven't have not enabled that for localization yet that feature we only enabled it for uh, english only for now we are still doing our internal testing because uh, the challenge we are looking uh, we are having there is uh, and actually that piece is still in in um, development so once the customer let's say provide a review we have to incorporate that in our translation memory so that's something we are still working on uh, but those are the other details we still need to figure out how how do we assign a reviewer or how many any reviewers we should assign for any external customer or internal customer who wants to provide a feedback hmm. okay uh, and Marcel oh and Daphne is Typing now. Thanks for the answer. Great talk, by the way. Learned a lot. Uh, but back in the list of questions, Marcel had uh, a question for, uh, let's see, what, what validation is performed on English source content change prior to pushing to localization? Is there a negative feedback to any improper, improper publishing request? And I believe, is this for documentation or for software? Marcel probably just not. For, probably is <laughs> for documentation, actually. Okay, so. Any, any or all like API requests that come in. It's like you, you said, well, we have some validation, some tests that we do. So yes. I, I so guess, for, yeah. for English, we have a, a, a third party tool we use for analyzing English and it's directly hooked in our Git repository. So whenever um, author commits a chain, uh, commits something, it gets validated through that uh, tool. And um, basically it checks grammar, it checks all the other things which are needed for English validation. That's and then, pretty awesome. uh, yeah, thank you. And then, so if there is a, um, we have set up a threshold, if it's uh, the results are worse than 80% or 70%, then those commits do not get submitted. It gets validated before. The commits do not get merged into the master branch. Let me put it that way. And they have to fix uh, that and, and then basically uh, push it back. So that's how we do for English. But for localization, we are not doing any validation for that. But other validation we are doing is syntax. So with the markdown, uh, since there are fewer syntax, it's easy to validate. Uh, and then we are also checking the link because it's coming from MT. Obviously, all the links are not localized. So all the uh, internal links, inter when I say internal, um, basically uh, within Adobe, all the uh, links uh, referring to Adobe documentation are auto-localized. Uh, and then video links are auto-localized with captioning and everything. So all the captioning and, and their parameters have been um, uh, properly applied. So those are done during the validation step. Cool. Okay. So related to that, about, about, about the testing stuff that comes in, I, I posted a question just to keep Joe from having to repeat it about uh, when, uh, and this I guess mainly for, um, for software requests, the JSON that you get, I think uh, Xiang mentioned, um, well, if if the developers want to come up with a new format, that's fine, but they'll we'll work with them and they have to sort of create a converter that makes it into JSON that we can pro and then and then a converter back. Uh, this is a discussion we've had like a number of times at eBay uh, with varying results. Um, but um, so this is the one thing that um, it's, it's critical as a way to validate uh, uh, the JSON, I suppose. And this is less about documentation, but more about some strings in general. But it could also apply to 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 uh, documentation, say say data or whatever. Um, so is there is there is there is there an, a, a a model that the LTN team can provide, like a schema or something, and say if you comply with this, then your stuff is translatable. If you don't, then we can't translate it. Is there something that, that, that you could use? Shang, do, yeah. do you want to take the question? Or do you uh, want me to take the question? No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. 
so, uh, so I work with the uh, different engineering team, and and this question actually had come up before. So let's say, for example, um, for the teams that are using the Adobe INTL React library, then uh, some of the teams that they what they do is that they do some kind of linting to verify, you know, certain things are correct in their code, um, and it is their responsibility. We put the onus on them that you could call those command that we provided so that you can run locally what the UI looked like and that it harvests it correctly and that it calls Aladdin and you could see the translation yourself before you submit. So the onus is on the engineering team to make sure that they are doing it correctly. In fact, one of the products that I work with, they have 60 engineers. I cannot follow them around to make sure that they're all having proper check-ins so they have to do their job. Uh, and we educate them on how to do their job. There are other teams as well that says, okay, um, we have certain particular format, like, you know, whatever they want to harvest, then they would have to come up with their own harvester generating the JSON that we need. And our JSONs are fairly simple. It's really just key value pair. That's all they need. So, um, so we work with them to make sure that works properly. So we don't necessarily have to have a validator or a schema because it is so simple. And that's the approach that we go with. Right. I guess at eBay, we used to have a lot of uh, very adventurous developers that would constantly try to invent new ways to break things. Uh, so, uh, oh, let's let we have this model. Let's overload it and put our own meanings into it. And then um, not knowing what they were breaking down the line. Uh, for this, like, we, we, we were very heavy on of course, this started a long time ago on, on XML, which has a, a nice ability to validate uh, using schemas and BDDs. Um, so JSON obviously misses that, doesn't have that to begin with. Um, so I, I was wondering, uh, so I had quite a few discussions with our architecture teams on how to implement like validation and things like that. So I was wondering where Adobe what, uh, was with this, but I think, it, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I think it's a it's a kind of a mindset. So in Adobe, uh, what we are thinking about uh, is, I think in Adobe for digital experience business unit, uh, we think maybe two three years ago we adopted unified engineering model. So what that means is uh, the engineering guys they take the full responsibility of their features, from implementation to test. Uh, even for the DevOps, so they take the full responsibility, and localization is a is one of them. So that back to the point is, uh, the globalization team we focus on the standard way to do that. In our case, the standard way uh, for the for the type of the contents is JSON for for software and the markdown for for documentation. And the engineer, they need to think about how to convert, if they are using some other format, how to convert it to a, a unique format. And then that will save a lot of energy because the core team, they have their freedom to do whatever different way to, to do. And if we have a unified uh, format, then it will save a lot of time on our side. And also it will be much, I mean, easier for the core team instead of globalization team to do the uh, converter, to, to do the test, to make sure the converter works well or not, because they know much than others. So, so it's a kind of a mindset. If they want to do some other way, they can do that, that but they need to take the responsibility to convert it to the unified way, which globalization team provide as a standard. Right, thank you, I, I, I understand that. It's it just like, because, as you put you put these automation walls around localization and it's automatic you throw it in it comes out you don't even know what goes on it's like the need to understand that there are certain liabilities responsibilities as a dev team to make sure what you put in there it's good it becomes becomes um harder to convey i mean for no other reason because you're behind an api now it's not even just a, a, a web portal where you have to go in and submit requests. It just push it down the pipeline using a curl or whatever. Um, so I, it's like the, the 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 training and the interaction with the developers and making them understand, especially with a big company like Adobe, 
which has so many products and so many developers uh it's just an amazing achievement to 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 keep things going uh the way you are there's always carrot in a stick yeah okay well uh boy i'd like to end it right there in the carrot and the stick but we, we have a few more uh questions here yeah uh, and uh <coughs> diehards hanging on your every word um carmen who also has uh, posted a thank you for a great talk uh, in there. Awesome, awesome presentation, she said. Uh, she is asking, is MT scoring and training or retraining part of your workflow, or is that something performed on your vendor's side? Jeff, yeah, sure. do you want to answer that question? Or uh, you both asked each other if you want to ask answer this question. <laughs> so, so who, who would like to answer? Just raise your hand. Um, so I, I think Jeff is muted, um, and yeah. I can add it, Shang, and yeah. you can add it yeah, to my my answer. So we have a um, we do use vendor to get the empty quality and. Um, uh, get tested, but but we have our internal t people to watch on that, and they they make sure uh, they get a lot of scores, uh, like Blue Score. We use Blue Score. There are other scores. Uh, on top of that, I don't remember, but we have a, a dedicated uh, couple of people who are uh, responsible for MT quality uh, validation. Okay. Um. We got a few questions here from someone who using is using the name Granada 2018. I'd rather you don't use handles in this uh, uh, chat room here, but uh, I'm sure you're one of our colleagues. So uh, we've got a, some good questions here. So that proves it. Uh, <clears throat> first one is, are there external people taking advantage of the community option? I think it's for the documentation also. Yeah, Re repeat that question again, Joe. Are there external people taking advantage of the community option? Ajay, you're mute. Thank you. Uh, I think you already answered that, right? Sorry, this is Rebecca. I'm Granada, two, 2010, Rebecca. Right? Oh, the there we are. That's the way the system, yeah, logged <laughs> yeah. me in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I you answered. already answered that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You thank. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, how about this one then? Hi, Rebecca. Um, Hi. How many people hours per month, or however you want to quantify it, does it take to maintain all of this, including software and docs, uh, now that it has been built? So, in other words, not the server people, but just all the other stuff that has to go on. People hours, mythical people hours. <laughs> I work all the time. Uh, since both my manager and the director are here, I work all the time. So <laughs> just, to, just to validate that, okay. Uh, but do you mean maintaining the tools or are you talking about translation and localization? No, actually maintaining all of this infrastructure. So in other words, I know, I understand that the server team does a lot of this, but for you all on the globalization team to maintain the rest of it in the tools, how many of them are you who work pretty much full time on this? Uh, go ahead, Sean. Why'd you go for it? Uh, for software, uh, for example, Aladdin, uh, we have uh, two, three members, but it's not fully. Uh, we still spend at least half of the uh, manpower to work on the daily uh, product uh, localization, uh, the pr process management, and so on. Focus on the allotting uh, service, uh, the, uh, the the infrastructure itself is uh, yeah, it's very <laughs> very limited. And also, we focus on enhancement uh, instead of uh, just the uh, uh, maintenance. And Ajay, maybe uh, you can put more information related with documentation side. Yes, uh, for documentation, I'm the only engineer who work on on most of the architecture and in issue stuff, but we also have, um, as in my presentation, I showed a backend 
uh, Adobe Localization Framework backend infrastructure. And that for that, we have a dedicated team who builds a lot of other globalization tool and plugins. Um, so th th that's a big team and they, they not only just support um, documentation, but also anything related like MT connectors or even um, other APIs. So they, they are dedicatedly working on those tools. So um, it's hard to say how much time they focus on documentation because uh, they are working on a lot of different things. But uh, for the documentation side, uh, as I'm the one who, who usually interacts with them and asks for any request if they need to done, uh, the, the, the changes need to be done at the deeper level of, of the, the architecture. For example, if I need to change anything on the uh, back end where machine translation is not delivering anything which is expected, then I have to reach out to them. But anything apart from that, uh, like testing, validation, all that is done on Jenkins, which I own the responsibility of uh, maintaining that. Okay, thank you. That gives me an idea. Thanks. Yeah, she needs. She needs. She needs to quantify this for all of us. That's what it is. No, <laughs> no. It's just I, I know that it's a big team. It, it takes a lot, and it's it's really impressive with what Adobe's accomplished. So that's what I, I wanted to feel for it. Thanks. Thank yeah, you. to give you a pers little more perspective, it, it it took us time to reach us here. Uh, we started this initiative, at least for documentation. We started this initiative of moving and supporting uh, continuous localization for documentation in 2018, late 2018 or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, we just have a small idea and then it grew big from there. We started adding more more additions as we grew uh, and as we learned. Yeah. yeah. So the software is the same. And also uh, is uh, exclude the, for example, the team who is working on the improvement of uh, the, the machine translation engine. So that's a little bit separate. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, Rebecca had more good questions. She, she has the best question of all coming up. But first, Igor slid one in there while she was typing. Uh, Igor is asking, <laughs> do you have your own in-house TMS slash CAT tool for an MTPE? Or do you integrate with some commonly available product? Yes, um, um, Shang, I can take that. So we, we, we use a third party uh, TMS system. We don't have any inbuilt TMS system, but we do have our uh, plugin, which basically makes sure that let's say if we switch the TMS system from one vendor to another, that middleware uh, uh, plugin will take care of it. Instead, so on the other side, uh, any internal tool which is using Adobe uh, localization framework backend, we don't have to worry about uh, switching between uh, different translation management system or or machine translation services. So does that hope that answers your question? Answers it for me. We'll see if Igor has more questions now. Rebecca's. Uh... Next question is, can you share any of the features that you're thinking of adding in the future? Uh, definitely there are lots, especially I think for, uh, for automation testing uh, is, the, is the area which we really need to keep improving. And maybe in the near future, we'll think about how we can leverage uh, whatever machine, trans uh, machine learning or AI kind of technology jump into that area which can really provide a more accurate or uh, easy way for the developers can leverage, but can cover the internationalization localization uh, issues at the early phase within their development cycle. Hmm. Automation, because Adobe has large and repeatable stuff to do. That's yeah. good. Automation um, is, is the key. Yes. It would be very challenging. I wish Tex was here to jump on that, but <laughs> I'm, a, I'm in favor of it. I just want you to know. Uh, so uh, Rebecca has another question. Do you apply this workflow in any way to marketing, support, or any other type of content? Um, for marketing materials, um, marketing and support uh, up until now, not yet, because of marketing, uh, 
is uh, require more uh, accurate uh, translation. Uh, using machine translation for marketing materials is a little bit dangerous. So now uh, we are uh, taking the first step, focus on the, the product documentation. Suppose uh, it's a kind of, uh, uh, we are thinking about that, but not for now yet. Uh, leveraging machine translation to do the support, especially, uh, for example, for uh, with uh, fake example, so, uh, slide, uh, uh, Slack support, or some, uh, I mean, the, 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 the how do you say that? The, uh, the social channel support is very efficient uh, by leveraging uh, machine translation. It's in the pipeline, but uh, it's uh, still, yeah, just in, in, the, in the plan. Uh, we haven't worked on that yet. Yeah, hope this uh, answers your question. <clears throat> okay, well, feel, to let, feel free to let us know. Uh, it is, if these... thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and also, Igor chimed in uh, when you asked, uh, does that answer the question about the TMS? And uh, he's got no more questions for me today, but also, uh, was already typing thanks for the great presentation insightful discussion and for answering lots of questions today in fact there's several messages like that in there uh and uh where were we oh yeah so i think uh marcel we were already going over do the development teams understand the trade-offs are they fully aware of the potential issues with pushing out mt we probably uh, already covered that uh and then, you know, unless you have uh, more to ask about that. Um, and then Peter, let's see, uh, Ajay answered Peter's questions here about, uh, do you use a static site generator like DocFX, uh, so on. Let's see, that, that was a long one. Maybe we can skip that because uh, uh, Peter seems happy with those answers. If you have more, Peter, let us know. Uh, Daphne apologizes, she has one more question. Uh, any challenges for product devs to use the latest version for your libraries? Yes, some teams are trying to stabilize their code and they don't want to upgrade, but then carrots and sticks. If you don't upgrade, you're gonna lose some features. So do it and we'll help you. Excellent. So there's always I, challenges, yeah. Yeah, but I guess uh, my next question will be, since there are always challenges, how do you enforce them to really do it so we can, you know, deprecate, let's say, a gem, right? You know, or just so that a customer can have a better translation results. Well, Marcel uh, says you need to hit them with carrots. <laughs> then it's a double, then it's definitely a double whammy. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's also about working with them. So you're talking about getting better translation. So then therefore what you're meaning is that once you have updated or corrected translation and fixes after you validate the UI, you will ask to request the, the fix and push. And definitely our product um, managers does work with the product teams, product managers saying how important it is you know, how do we leverage push? And having continuous localization is good because I, I did used to work for the Photoshop team for quite a, a number of years to do uh, internationalization and globalization for them. And we started out with an 18 month release cycle that worked down to a bi-weekly. So for them to release once a year after they had like cut the GM is very difficult to push them to say, can you make these changes? But on a continuous release cycle, the opportunities is there to just keep churning and, and making changes. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're happy to work with them and we keep an open communication channels to work with them on that. All I've got are thank yous in here now. Uh, you know, uh, Marcel's thanking Alice, Ajay, Xiang, and JF for a great session, a wonderful iMug event supported in true Adobe fashion. Thanks for sharing so many of your internal experiences without sugarcoating. And Yuka, from Barcelona, by the way, uh, writes, thank you for the great presentation. I second Marcel, that's why I stay awake. There is something about hey, iMug that cannot be gotten anywhere else. Look forward to the recording to be posted. 
Yeah, well, these, these talks are only as good as the uh, sharing that gets done, and we really appreciate that because, as you can see, there are a lot of shared problems in the community, and just knowing what you're up against and how you're dealing with them really helps. Thank you. So, anything else? Any Great. last Thank words? Thank you very please? much for everybody uh, and a lot of good discussions. And um, yeah, and also thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you very much. And, and Roger, thank you for uh, organizing this uh, great event and give us the, the opportunity to share our learning, our experience on, on building those uh, continuous localization framework. So yeah, let's keep in touch and uh, we are, we're open to all of the discussions. If you uh, feel free to reach out to us.